Hello, my name is Leslie Lopez. I'm faculty at the Center for Labor Education and Research, and I submitted the following pages on behalf of the center from our website, which was largely compiled and organized by our director, Dr. William Pewitt. I chose key events in Hawaii labor history, beginning with 1938, the Hilo Massacre, which happened on August 1st, it was when a peaceful demonstration of sympathy strikers was attacked by the Hilo police. 50 unarmed unionists, men and women, were hit with shotgun fire. The action was organized by Harry Kamoku under the slogan, we are all brothers under the skin. Dr. Pewitt researched the book and he and Chris Conybear interviewed the strikers. Uh, the video is also located on that page. The next event was the uh, Great Sugar Strike, 1946. Uh, in that strike, about 26,000 sugar workers and their families went on a 79-day strike beginning on September 1st, 1946. That strike completely shut down 33 of Hawaii's 34 plantations. The next event I chose to share was the 1946, or 49, sorry, dock strike, known as the Great Hawaiian Dock Strike. In that strike, longshore workers in Hawaii went on strike for six months from May 1st to October 25th to win wage parity with mainland dock workers. I also included the Honolulu Record, which is a labor newspaper published from 1948 to 1958. It's consisting of 10 volumes and almost uh, 5,100 pages of text. Uh, it was a chronicle from the worker perspective in the labor movement in Hawaii. Koji Ariyoshi was the editor and Frank Marshall Davis also contributed I wanted to also include this article by um, uh, Thompson, this Thompson article uh, with the title, The ILWU is a Force for Interracial Unity. I wanted to include it because it illustrates that cross-cultural organizing was never easy. It was very hard work. Uh, people had to put their own politics on the back burner for the good of the broader economic cause. And although they were willing to do that, it wasn't easy to get um, you know, people from different ethnicities to work together. And uh, he does uh, tell some stories about the difficulties in doing that in this piece. Then I also wanted to showcase the 1951 uh, Lanai strike. Uh, it was a wildcat strike. What makes it significant is that uh, against the advice of ILWU's Louis Goldblatt and Jack Hall, 800 predominantly Filipino, Japanese, and Hawaiian pineapple workers uh, who were working on the world's largest pineapple plantation run by a very powerful corporation, Hawaiian Pineapple Dole. Uh, they were trying to negotiate with them individually, Dole with each plantation. Dole was trying to negotiate with each plantation individually. And uh, Goldblatt and, and Hall felt like, you know, it was not a good time to go on strike. However, they did it anyway, and it was a long strike. It was uh, over 200 days. But not only did they gain a 15 cent wage increase for themselves, three, more, three cents more than they asked for, uh, and a seven cent an hour in, uh, increase at seven companies, 9,000 workers industry-wide. They also won union recognition uh, you, uh, you know, for all the pineapple workers, uh, union shop and job seniority. I mean, that's really a significant win uh, considering that, you know, there were almost 10,000 pineapple workers at the time working in the canneries and in agriculture. The strike was led by ILW business agent uh, Pedro de la Cruz. Of course, the important thing about all of these strikes is that they were able to organize all workers in one union, regardless of race, uh, color, or gender. The momentum generated by these strikes uh, led to the Democratic Revolution of 1954 and marks a turning point when Hawaii workers took power away from the Republican-dominated legislature controlled by the Big Five and put it back into the hands of working people. This change also marked the occupational shift in Hawaii's economy from dependence on plantations to tourism, which increased occupational opportunities, especially for indigenous women and women of color in Hawaii. This table from our site shows union density today, and it provides longitudinal data uh, over the past 20 years. Hawaii has remained in the top three in the US. How does the public benefit from high union density? 
Civil service employees represent the largest number of unionized workers in the state and provide key services to public schools, parks, hospitals, and roads. In addition, unions reduce wage inequality and set pay standards for non-union employers and provide important benefits like sick leave and health insurance, which is a critical public issue, health issue in a pandemic. The correlation between unions and the health and safety of the community is well established. Employers don't willingly offer increased wages, pensions, or health care to their workers. In low union density states, or what are known as right to work states, wages are lower and workers are less likely to have employer sponsored health insurance, pensions, or sick leave. All workplace benefits have been hard won by working people. Thanks to their bravery, we have the benefits we might take for granted, like breaks, sick leave, pensions, seniority, OSHA regulations, and even more timely now, PPE face masks for essential workers. Thank you for listening. I look forward to the panel and thank you so much for participating. Bye-bye.